it was the uh, Software uh, Research Institute or Institute for Software Research, and also SciLab. Lori uh, received all her degrees from Washington University in St. Louis. Um, and uh, after that, she was with uh, ATRD Research uh, for a number of years. And uh, we are lucky that AT&T Research did not do so well, uh, and that she chose to come to Carnegie Mellon. Uh, Lori's research is obviously in usable security and privacy, and uh, she is probably the only person who uh, serves soups in cups securely. Uh, and uh, Lori will talk today about a very interesting topic, namely privacy notice and choice. We all get privacy notices. And the question is what choice we have uh, when we don't really read those privacy notices. Laurie, Thank you. it's all yours. Thank you. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to talk about privacy notice and choice. Um, and this is a topic that's kind of near and dear to my heart um, because I, I feel like the, the 15 years of privacy notice and choice uh, is kind of, uh, you know, the, the 15 years or so of my um, post-educational uh, uh, career. And I, I feel like uh, I've, I've kind of been immersed in this. Um, and uh, I've I've uh, spent some time over the past year or so kind of reflecting back on um, you know, what has happened in this space over the past 15 years and um, where, where are we? Have we actually made any progress? Um, unfortunately, it's not all good news. Um, I'll give you, you know, the punchline up front. Um, but it's kind of interesting what has happened along the way and uh, what we've learned. Um, and I'm hoping that perhaps um, we can make use of some of the lessons that we've learned and not continue to make the same mistakes over and over again. Uh, so let's start uh, with some definitions here. Uh, so privacy, notice, and choice, what is that? Uh, well, let's start with what is privacy? Um, so there are many definitions of privacy, and I could spend a whole lecture going through all of those, but I'm not. I'm just going to stick with one definition and the definition that is most relevant to this discussion. Um, and so this is the definition that comes from Alan Weston, who wrote a book back in 1967, Privacy and Freedom. And Weston says that privacy is the claim of individuals, uh, groups, or institutions to determine for themselves when, how, and to what extent information about them is communicated to others. Uh, so this definition of privacy is focused on the idea of control, that we have privacy when we're able to control how our information is um, conveyed to others, when and if it's conveyed to others. All right, so that's privacy. What about notice and choice? All right, notice and choice is the idea that we can give people privacy, give people control over their information by, first of all, telling them what we're going to do with their information, and secondly, giving them choices about that. Um, and so typically on a website, we'll have notice in the form of your, a privacy policy. Um, and here it says how Yahoo uses your personal information. Um, and most of us don't ever go and read these things, but they're there somewhere and you can scroll through and read lots of gory details about um, how they're going to use your data. And then choice is where you find that link that says opt out. And you can go click on it and say, hey, I don't like how you're going to use my data. Stop it. Um, and that's where you have your choice. Um, and so this is uh, the, the concept of notice and choice as put forward by the online industry. Um, and uh, this has been advocated uh, by the industry as a part of a self-regulatory process. Um, basically, what the industry has been saying for about the past 15 years is, you know, we, we might not need any new privacy laws. Um, most of the privacy laws uh, that we have in the US are very sector specific. We don't really need any sort of overriding comprehensive cross sector privacy law because the industry can self regulate and we can do notice and choice and that is going to give people privacy. Well, there's a lot of pushback to that idea, as you might imagine. And privacy advocates often say, hey, that's not good enough. And one of the reasons that they say that's not good enough is that 
nobody wants to read these privacy notices and no one wants to have to stop at every company they do business with, every website they visit to go and find that opt out link and to read it and understand it and to click it. Um, and so this is a really complicated thing that we're asking users to do. It's a big burden that we're putting on users in order to have privacy. So. Uh, back in 1996, uh, the Federal Trade Commission was looking into this. Congress had asked them to uh, co come up with a, a study and a report as to whether there should be any um, new privacy laws. And uh, the FTC started asking industry to, um, to respond to this, this problem of notice and choice being kind of cumbersome for consumers. So they held a workshop. And um, the... It, 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 in this report about the workshop, uh, it says, the workshop focused on current online uses of personal information, the core elements of voluntary privacy protections, new interactive technologies for enhancing notice and choice, and the government's role in protecting consumer privacy online. Um, and so what they were talking about here is, all right, we don't want users to have to go and read all these privacy policies. We're going to have some technology solution. And it's going to give you enhanced notice and choice. Um, and it, it's going to have a nice uh, interactive experience. And you will be able to set things up to automatically exercise notice and choice for you. All right, so this sounded um, very exciting. Um, what did they uh, actually mean by that? Um, well, there were a few things that, that came out around that time. Um, there was um, uh, an industry uh, effort to put forward the notion of privacy seals, um, and uh, they, they had the e-trust seal uh, that later became the trust e seal. Um, but the idea was that you would uh, put these e-trust seals on your website, and people wouldn't have to read that whole privacy policy. At a glance, they could see which category you were in, and there were three different levels of privacy um, that you could put on your website there with these seals. Um, the other thing that happened was the industry proposed something um, called P3. It later became P3P uh, for the Platform for Privacy Preferences. Um, and the idea here was that we would have some sort of a computer-readable language for privacy policies, and your web browser would read them for you, and it would decide whether or not to accept the deal um, and could seamlessly negotiate privacy on your behalf. Um, this was a project that I was uh, very much involved in. Um, some of the things that people were saying about P3P, um, Christine Varney, who's a former FTC commissioner, said, P3P will help responsible online businesses empower users to choose the privacy relationship best for them. Um, Larry Lessig uh, said, in the context of proper legislation, P3P is the most promising solution to cyberspace privacy. It will make it easy for companies to explain their practices in a form that computers can read and make it easy for consumers to express their preferences in a way that computers will automatically respect. So lots of excitement and hope and promise for this idea of P3P. Um, around that time, uh, Esther Dyson uh, wrote a newsletter article. Uh, she, re she published a, a newsletter called Release 1.0. So back in the, 19 the February 1997 issue, of Dyson's uh, Release 1.0 newsletter, she described the situation about privacy. Um, and basically what she said is, currently the government is indeed paying substantial attention to privacy issues on several fronts. The Federal Trade Commission is conducting a long-term privacy initiative and is planning a privacy workshop to study technical tools and self-regulatory models. The Commerce Department is compiling a report on the issue around privacy self-regulation. As a general matter, says the NTIA chief counsel, we favor self-regulation, but self-regulation with teeth. There are also several bills pending in Congress. Okay, so this was the state of things in 1997. Um, now let's fast forward to 2010. What's going on now? Well, uh, Dyson had talked about the FTC studying the issue, and guess what? The FTC in 2010, almost 15 years later, is studying the issue, and they issued a draft report last December and are expected to issue a final report this December. Um, Dyson also talked about the Department of Commerce looking into things. Well, guess what? The Department of Commerce issued a report in December. And she also talked about bills in Congress. And guess what? There are now several bills in Congress looking at online privacy. Um, 
There were also uh, uh, various industry initiatives. I showed you the e-trust icons. Um, well, now we have advertising option icons, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, these icons are starting to appear in the corner of advertising online. Um, and the idea is that if you see one of these, uh, so here's an example on the, um, the ad on the right column here. If you see one, you can click on it and you can get your notice about what sorts of behavioral tracking is associated with this ad. And then if you want to exercise your choice options, you can click on it and you can go to this industry page where you can set opt-out cookies and opt-out of advertising. Um, and you can opt out just for this company or you can take advantage of opting out from a whole um, bunch of companies uh, that have signed up. Um, and there's also competition in this space. Not only do we have um, this particular opt-out page, but we have many others. So there's a company called Evidon, and they've set up an even bigger opt-out page that lets you opt out of even more companies. Um, so looks like uh, lots of movement in this space. Um, there's also more discussion about computer-readable privacy policies. P3P was supposed to be the big deal. Um, it never really ended up... Uh, panning out that way, and we'll talk more about that, um, but now trustee in their new incarnation is talking about machine-readable XML policies once again. Um, we're also seeing new approaches to icons. Um, the, uh, some of the folks working on the Firefox web browser at Mozilla came up with a proposed set of privacy icons um, that we could put on websites. Um, the FTC, in their December 2010 report, talked about making privacy notices clearer, shorter, and more standardized. And the Future of Privacy Forum, in their 2011 in and out list on privacy, talked about as being in nutritional label privacy notices. Um, so everybody's talking about how to make these privacy policies easier. Right? This is 15 years later, and it's starting to feel a bit like Groundhog Day. Uh, especially 15th anniversary edition. I thought, wow, yeah, these things have been going on and on and on. Not much has actually changed over the past 15 years. Okay, so here's what I'm going to talk about for uh, the rest of uh, our, the talk today. Um, I want to tell you a little bit more about P3P um, and talk about some of the work that we've done on privacy nutrition labels. Um, then I want to talk about some of the work we've done looking at the adoption and enforcement of some of these mechanisms. Um, I want to talk about Do Not Track, which is probably the latest initiative um, in this privacy notice and choice area. Um, talk about some of the work that we've done um, just recently. This is hot off the presses on the usability of tools that limit online behavioral advertising. And then I'll conclude with some recommendations. Okay, so P3P. Um, as I mentioned, the idea behind P3P is that nobody wants to read privacy policies. Um, and uh, so we wanted to have some, some solution to this problem. Um, and uh, the solution is to let the computer read the privacy policies for you. Um, and so P3P was uh, developed and standardized by the W3C. Um, and it basically is an XML language for privacy policies. Um, and uh, the idea is that this XML can be transferred through HTTP headers. Uh, there is an optional P3P compact policy, uh, which is a much shorter version uh, that talks about the privacy practices with respect to cookies. Um, and the idea behind the compact policy is that we can very quickly drop um, the privacy information with the cookie, and then the web browser can evaluate it when it's deciding whether or not to accept the cookie. Um, the uh, P3P was first implemented in IE6, um, and it's also in IE7, also in IE8. Oh, and I forgot to update the slide. It's also in IE9 as well. Um, virtually, the implementation is virtually unchanged between IE6, 7, and 8. Okay, so a little bit more history on P3P. Um, the idea behind it was first discussed uh, actually in 1995 um, at, at an FTC meeting. Again, again, it was discussed in 1996 um, at the FTC. And in the fall of 1996, there was the Internet Privacy Working Group, which was uh, kind of an ad hoc group of both companies and um, advocacy groups that came together to talk about 
can we actually figure out how to build this thing? Um, that's when I got involved. I had um, just been hired by AT&T, and um, they sent me to Washington to go talk to these people who were thinking about doing this privacy thing. Um, and I discovered that I was one of two uh, technology people in the room. Everybody else was a lawyer or a policy wonk of some uh, type. And uh, so they looked at the two, us two technologists, and they said, well, this is what we want to do. Can you build it? Um, and, uh, you know, I was, you know, fresh out of graduate school and I'm like, oh yeah, piece of cake, sure, just give, give us a few months, we'll, we'll take care of it. Um, actually, it turned out it took about seven years. Um, it wasn't because the technology was difficult, but uh, we had to start with, okay, so we want to encode privacy concepts in XML, All right? What privacy concepts do we want to encode? How much detail should we go into? Um, and these types of things took just years and years of debate to try to agree on what was that actual vocabulary for privacy that we needed to encode and how much detail do we need and where should the defaults be and things like that. Um, we also got uh, sidetracked along the way. There was a patent issue um, that uh, everybody kind of threw up their hands and said, I'm not touching it until we resolve that. So that derailed us for about a year as well. Uh, also questions about, you know, should we have automatic negotiation protocols? Should we have um, your web browser, if you agree to transfer information, should it just automatically fill out the forms and ship your information off? Um, all of those uh, made it more complicated and, and it made it take a lot longer. Um, but eventually in 2002, we did issue a W3C recommendation on P3P um, and then started working on P3P 1.1. Um, in November 2006, we gave up on P3P 1.1. Um, we did publish a, a note um, explaining what it was, but it was never formally standardized, mostly because the industry um, uh, members of the working group had completely lost interest by that point. Okay, um, so P3P started out with this notion of being a framework for automated privacy discussions. So, I should be able to, as I'm browsing around the web, I go to a website and my web, my web browser should say to the website, what's your privacy policy? And the website should say back in a computer readable language, well, this is what it is. And my web browser can say, no, I don't like that. Can I get a better deal? And we should be able to have some sort of negotiation. Um, that was the idea. It should look something like this. Um, and uh, this, this was actually, I, I, I dug into my, um, my archive and found this slide that I had actually used in a presentation in 1997 describing how P3P was going to work. Um, of course, it didn't actually get built that way. Um, the whole negotiation bit ended up getting pulled out of P3P for a lot of reasons, um, mainly because the um, companies involved weren't quite sure how they were going to do this negotiation. It was hard enough for them to come up with one privacy policy, let alone a set of them that they can negotiate with customers about. Um, so that was kind of a non-starter. Uh, so what we ended up with was really just taking the privacy policy, encoding it in XML, and um, having a protocol to ship that around. Um, and uh, so the XML looks something like this. Um, obviously, nobody wants to read it. Um, but fairly simple XML statements about privacy. And what we ended up with in IE6 is that um, if you go to a website that has cookies, IE will look for um, the P3P policy and actually the P3P compact policy and use that to make cookie blocking decisions. And if cookies are blocked, you get this little symbol here on the bottom of your screen, which most people have no idea whatsoever what it means. Um, but if you click on it, then you get a list of your cookies and you find out um, whether they were blocked or not. Um, and then there's also this uh, privacy report you can get in IE where it takes the XML and translate it translates it back into English for you. Um, there are also some privacy settings in IE that um, don't actually say P3P on them anywhere, but actually behind the scenes, it's all P3P making it work. Um, another thing that most people are not at all aware of. Um, so that, that's what it ended up looking like in IE. Um, it was really nice to see that IE um, went ahead and implemented P3P. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't a very complete implementation. It had lots of bugs and um, here we are almost 10 years later and those bugs haven't been fixed. 
Um, there are also a bunch of uh, research prototypes uh, that were built related to P3P. So one that we built here is called Privacy Finder. Um, and the idea is that we wanted to build P3P instead of into a web browser, into a search engine. Um, and so you go ahead and do your Google or Yahoo or whatever sort of search. Um, and then we take the search results, check for P3P policies um, on those search results, and compare them with your personal preferences. So here's a Privacy Finder. And um, you can see we've annotated all the search results with a privacy meter. So we can see uh, how good the privacy policy is at each of those websites. OK, so that was P3P. Um, and uh, it, it was uh, an interesting idea. Um, but in, in practice, it never really went very far. Um, and so we wanted to look at, well, what else can we do with the P3P data? Um, besides using it to block cookies, can we use it to make privacy policies more understandable and try to build uh, some sort of a automatically generated privacy policy that's generated from that XML data? Um, we thought about what we wanted that policy to look like um, and asked ourselves, you know, is there a way that we can build one that's really easy to understand, really fast to use, and really easy to compare, that I can take two policies, put them side by side, and find out which one is better. Um, and we got some, some inspiration uh, from food nutrition labels. Um, so, you know, you can look at these different boxes of cereal and very easily determine which one has the most sugar or the most calories or the lowest fat or whatever it is you're interested in. And so we wanted to do the same thing for privacy. And so we were looking for um, copying some of the things that seem to work well in the food labels, uh, such as having a standardized format, standardized language, keeping it pretty brief, and linking to the <clears throat> Looking to the extended view. Um, so you, know, you can look up here at the top of the label and you can see the fat and the sodium and the protein. And then at the bottom, you have all of the, uh, the detailed list of ingredients. And, and so we were looking at that concept as well. Um, we also looked at a lot of other types of consumer labels uh, for inspiration. And uh, then I uh, thought about how we could actually apply this to privacy. Uh, there are a number of challenges that we had. Um, one big challenge is that people are not familiar with privacy terminology. Um, so there's a lot of privacy jargon uh, that the privacy experts use, and the average person um, doesn't know at all what it means. Now, this is actually pretty similar to um, nutrition uh, jargon. Uh, so you know, there is a lot of uh, uh, a lot of terminology that nutrition experts use that probably before the um, nutrition labels came out, most of us had very little idea what it meant. But over time, we started to get used to seeing cholesterol and saturated fat and words like that on our nutrition labels. And over time, people started learning what they meant. Um, another challenge is the context. Um, the context matters a lot. Uh, if I find out that a company is collecting my social security number, um, I might be kind of upset about that. But if I know that they are a bank and they're required to by law and they're going to safeguard it, then maybe it's OK. Um, so there's a lot of things that I really need to understand the context of how my information is going to be collected and used to really understand whether it's OK or not. Um, with nutrition, there are some context, context things as well um, that I may need to know uh, whether I have specific food allergies or nutrition goals. But in general, whether, whether um, uh, I am uh, you know, eating the food in the morning or at night you know, probably doesn't really make any difference as far as the nutritional content. And so uh, arguably, context matters even more in privacy than it does in nutrition. Um, another challenge is the complexity of privacy policies. Um, you know, there's a reason why they're 10 pages long. There is actually a lot of complexity encoded in them. And so how do we distill that down to something very simple? Um, and finally, people don't actually understand the privacy implications of their choices. Um, you know, so if I give this company this piece of information, what, what is the implication of that? Um, how, it, how might that come back to haunt me? Um, tomorrow, next week, next year, 10 years from now. And that's something that people really have very little grasp of. 
So we used an iterative design process to uh, develop a privacy nutrition label. Um, Patrick Kelly, um, one of my PhD students, took the lead on that and um, actually won an ACM uh, research award for his work on this. Um, we did a series of studies, including focus groups, lab studies, online studies. Um, and uh, with each of our iterations, we looked at uh, reading comprehension, how well people were able to understand the policy and actually uh, glean information from it. Um, we looked at how long it would take someone to interact with it and find information. Um, we looked at how easily people could use the policy to compare it with other policies. And then we also looked at uh, people's subjective opinions, um, whether they thought it was easy, whether they thought it was interesting, whether they thought it was fun, and whether they actually trusted the information that they were looking at. This was one of our first attempts. Um, and uh, this was, quite frankly, a disaster. Um, and uh, th this was one of our uh, papers we wrote, uh, you know, lessons from failure sort of paper. Um, what we did is we took every field in P3P and we made a giant matrix that represented everything that you could possibly represent in that P3P XML in, in this matrix. Um, and we had... Um, I think uh, eight or nine uh, different symbols that were all um, in different shades of teal. And um, this uh, scrolled on and on and on. You're just seeing the very uh, top of it here. Um, and uh, the good thing about this was that everything was represented. And people who understood P3P looked at it and said, oh, wow, I can represent that whole policy here. This is great. Um, and everybody else looked at it and said, blah, um, this is just too much. This is information overload. <laughs> what are you kidding? Um, so uh, we, we did some testing on it. And yeah, sure enough, it didn't test very well. Um, and we went back to the drawing board. So after that, then we went back and looked at the food labels again and went back to something that was much more simple and food label-like. Um, we got feedback that it was too simple. Uh, so then we, we started doing something in between. Um, we did it all black and white. Then we brought back the color. And we ended up with what you see on the right, um, something that looks kind of like that. Um, so you see we still have this table, but it's a much simpler table than what we had in the original teal version. Um, so uh, we, we uh, used um, standard terminology, um, and in each cell in the table, we have, um, we have across the top how information is used, and down the sides, we have all the different types of information. And then in each cell, uh, a company can indicate that, yes, they collect and use that information, or no, they don't, or they do, but you can opt out, or they have an opt-in. Right? So there's four different buckets they can put themselves in, and they have to make a, a clear um, statement about them. They can't say, well, we usually don't share your information unless it's with very specially selected companies that we're sure you're really going to like because we're really good friends with them. Right? That, that's not an option here in P3P. Um, we also made it so that it was visually um, very easy to just kind of glance at and get a high-level overview of the level of information collection and, and use. Um, and so you can see that the darker it is, the more red on it, the more data is being collected and used. Um, and, the, and the more that it's light and blue, the less information is being collected and used. Um, and so uh, that, that makes it very glanceable. Um, also, you can put two side by side and compare them very easily because everything is in the same place. And so once you find out where, which row and column the information you really care about is, it's going to be in the same place in every policy. Um, okay, so how did we actually go from that really complicated one to this much simpler one? Um, so if I were to just uh, represent it with cells on a matrix, um, the really complicated one was something kind of like this, and, and it actually could be expanded to go, keep going down the page. And what we ended up with was this. Um, and so what we had to do was to collapse some of the rows and columns. Um, and so what we did is we looked at, all right, well, P3P has, um, what is it, four, uh, it has, um, nine different um, uh, types of information that you might collect, right? Well, um, we wanted to, well, it actually has more than that, but I'm showing you nine here. We wanted to reduce these down into a fewer number of rows. So we took, you know, this group of 
four different types of information, including website login IDs, click stream, activities on the site, computer information, and we wrapped it up into one, which we just called your activities on this site. We figured most users weren't really going to make a distinction between all of these very granular uh, levels of detail, and your activities on the site was going to capture it pretty well. Um, we did the same thing for reducing the number of columns. Um, so we had four different ways to describe how a website might profile you. And there were very good reasons for having four different ways. We could profile you with pseudonyms or with identif identification. We could profile you in a way that is just for our own analysis, or we could do it so that it's going to actually change what you see on the site. Okay, so these are all important distinctions to somebody, um, but probably to most users, these distinctions are going to be lost. And so we can just say profiling and capture all of these things. All right, so um, once we built this, um, in the final study that we, we did on it, um, we wanted to see um, how use usable it was. We did an online study with 763 participants um, conducted through Amazon's Mechanical Turk. Um, and we compared three different versions of our standardized privacy nutrition label with full length privacy policies and then um, something called a layered policy, which was something that was developed through another industry initiative. Um, we measured the time, accuracy, and enjoyability on information finding and comparison tasks. And what we found was across the board, our standardized formats were always superior. Um, there was only minor differences between the various formats that we tested, but the, the standardized formats in general um, ended up being much better. Um, so there were a number of benefits that we found of the standardized approach. Um, one was the structured information presentation, so people would know where to look to find things. Um, another was the clear labeling of whether information um, was being used or not. Uh, so a problem that we found in full length privacy policies is, let's say you want to know, is this company going to collect my social security number? So you read their policy and you don't find any information about social security number. In fact, you might even, um, if it's online, you might even search for the word social security number, and you don't find it mentioned anywhere. Can you conclude that they won't collect your social security number? No, you can't. Maybe they're just not mentioning it here. Maybe they, they bundled it into something like and other sensitive data or other financial data or something, and they didn't specifically say social security number. So it's very difficult to know one way or another whether they're going to collect your social security number. So with this um, standardized format, you have a spot for every piece of information that's important, and you can see at a glance what, what they're actually collecting. Um, we also found uh, that uh, using standardized terminology uh, was helpful, because then you don't have to um, stop every other sentence and say, uh, cookies, which are blah, 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 right? You can use the word cookies, and we, we've already defined what it is in a standard glossary that everybody can refer back to. Okay, okay so um, all of these ideas for, um, for ways of making notice and choice easier are nice. Um, but how widely adopted have they act actually been and how much enforcement is there that people actually are doing what they're saying they do in these policies? Um, because uh, if, if we have these great designs but nobody's using them, that's not useful. And if people are using them but they're not actually accurately reporting what they're doing, then that's misleading and, um, uh, and most likely illegal. Um, and that's a big problem. So uh, we did a number of studies to look at P3P adoption in particular. Um, I can tell you uh, nutrition label adoption is pretty much zero because that's just our research prototype um, and it hasn't gone into any sort of standards efforts, although we have gotten feedback um, from a number of companies that they like the ideas in it and we've seen a couple of them that have actually borrowed some of the ideas. Um, but with P3P adoption, we decided to do um, uh, kind of a big web crawl to find out how much, uh, how, how many companies were actually putting P3P on their websites. Um, and so uh, we, what we did is we, um, we compiled um, a list of search terms. Um, and so basically we got uh, uh, AOL to give us 20,000 randomly sampled search terms that their users were, were searching for. 
Um, and we also um, got e-commerce search terms. Um, at the time, there was this frugal front page that Google had, and they would um, every few seconds update a list of things people were searching for now. So we screen scraped that until we collected about 1,000 of those. Um, and then we ran these searches, and we took the top 10 results for each of these searches, and we checked to see if they had P3P. So this was how um, we, we were able to find out um, what sites had P3P, and then we were also able to evaluate uh, if they had P3P, whether the policy was good or bad by a number of different criteria. All right, so what we found is that um, if you look at the random AOL user search terms and look at those search results, about 10% of them had P3P, so not really that many. Um, if you looked at the e-commerce search terms, it was about 21%. So e-commerce sites more likely to have P3P than just your average internet site. And, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, we also found that the more popular the website, the more likely it was to have P3P. Uh, we found that if you looked at the search results as a whole, you know, the whole you know, top 10 search results, you had about two thirds of the time you would have at least one P3P result. Um, another thing that we observed along the way, though, was that there seemed to be a lot of errors in the P3P code that we were getting. So as we were parsing it, we're seeing, huh, there's a lot of these that actually have syntax errors in them. So we decided to follow up on this problem of errors and see what was going on with that. Um, and we decided to start our focus on P3P compact policies rather than the full policies, largely because they're a lot easier to handle and analyze um, because they're a lot shorter. So um, we crawled uh, the web and collected 33,000 P3P compact policies. Um, and we wrote scripts that would check them for syntax and semantic errors. So we're not looking to see whether they actually do what they say they do or whether their P3P policy matches their English language policy. All we're looking for is syntax errors and things that just can't be possible, that are contra con internally contradictory um, policies. Um, and um, so what we ended up looking for so in the compact policies uh, was, was for the required tokens. This was, um, this was a, a big category of problems that we had. So uh, there are a number of different tokens in a compact policy, and there are five that are required. You have to have a token rec that, that um, represents what types of information you collect, one for what purpose, how it's going to be used, one for the recipients, um, which basically says whether you're going to be sharing it or not, one for the retention, how long it's going to be stored, and one for access. So can the user actually get access to their information? If it doesn't have those five tokens, it's not a valid compact policy. Okay. Um, now this is really important because of the fact that Internet Explorer is using these tokens to make the cookie blocking decisions, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and it turns out that what Internet Explorer is doing is if it gets a third party cookie and it doesn't have that P3P compact policy, it just rejects it. Um, and if it does have it, then it parses it to see if it is satisfactory according to Microsoft. Um, so what we found is that 34% of the compact policies we analyzed had errors. Um, and we found uh, these errors even in trusty certified websites. Um, we found them even in uh, companies that were members of the various industry consortiums. Um, and, and it's quite likely that there's even more errors than what we detected. These are only the ones that we could very easily detect, mostly due to the syntax errors. Um, it appeared that most of the errors were actually likely put in there on purpose so that their cookies wouldn't get blocked. Okay? Because if they had no compact policy, their cookie would get blocked by Internet Explorer. And if they had an unsatisfactory one, it would get blocked. So what they did is they found a way of making a satisfactory compact policy to prevent their cookies from getting blocked, regardless of whether that matched what the company actually does with information. Um, so uh, we, we started looking for some, some more evidence that that was what was going on. I mean, we, we were pretty convinced of it, but you know, how, how do you really know that, that that's what happened? So we started digging deeper, and we noticed that there were a large number of websites that had identical bogus compact policies. And that seemed like not really a coincidence, um, especially when we found you know, like 3,000 
sites that all had identical uh, policies with syntax errors. And so we started Googling for those strings, and we found that, um, that in fact, there were, there were two sources of, um, of uh, policies that a lot of people were copying. There was one that was in um, the Microsoft um, uh, help pages, and one was in um, a blog uh, on the O'Reilly website. Uh, here's the Microsoft one. Um, so this was uh, the help and support site, and basically it says uh, you can add a P3P compact policy header to your child content, and you can declare that no malicious accent actions are performed with the data of the user, right? And it says um, a simple compact policy that fulfills this criteria are as follows, right? So basically, if you're on this page because you're a website administrator, you're having this problem, you're going to go read through that and go, okay, I'll just copy this put it on my website, and guess what? Your problem will be solved. Okay, It doesn't tell you anything about what this P3P actually means or that this is actually in some ways a legal contract and that you may be representing something about your use of data that's not true. And so there were about 3,000 um, websites that appeared to have just copied this and, um, and solved their problem that way. Um, looking at some of the most popular websites, um, we found that 21 out of the top 48 visited sites have compact pop that have compact policies have errors. Um, 134 out of 391 trustee certified sites with compact policies had errors. Um, and one out of the 11 network advertisers with compact policies had errors. Um, looking at some big companies, Amazon, right, their compact policy was AMZN. It's a completely bogus, made-up P3P token. Um, and it was clear that they put it in there so that their, um, th their compact policy was, wouldn't cause their, their cookies to get blocked. Um, Facebook, theirs was DSP law. So those are valid P3P tokens, but you know, you're supposed to have at least five categories. And these are actually optional ones. They're not, these don't represent any of the five categories they have to have. Um, previously, when we checked, their, their compact policy was honk. I don't know why. That's not a valid P3P token at all. Um, all right, so this got some attention. There was a New York Times article um, about our study. Um, in last February, uh, we went and, and checked again, and we found that there were a number of companies that we had flagged the first time around who went ahead and just dropped their compact policies altogether and stopped using P3P. Um, a few of them actually um, changed their compact policies and made them valid, but not very many. Um, Amazon changed theirs. They, they, at that point, changed it so they had a valid compact policy, but they also added a note that said that they don't like P3P. Um, and Facebook changed theirs, and now it says um, CP equals Facebook does not have a P3P policy. Learn why here. Um, now, this uh, it, you know, is kind of brilliant because um, it's, you know, they're telling you this is not a P3P policy, and yet it prevents Internet Explorer from blocking their cookie because Internet Explorer, buggy as it is, thinks it's a P3P policy. So it's brilliant. Um, in March, uh, a class action lawsuit was filed against Amazon um, over this. Um, that's still pending, um, and it will be interesting to see whether um, anything comes of it. Um, a lot of people have asked me why the Federal Trade Commission isn't going after these companies, and that's a question I have asked the Federal Trade Commission myself and um, haven't actually gotten an answer. All right, so it seems clear from this that this sort of self-regulation has been pretty ineffective. Um, we can't actually rely on this computer-readable policies um, for accurate information. Um, we have a situation where uh, Microsoft built a tool that was supposed to help consumers, but it was buggy. It doesn't actually properly do syntax checking, and as a result, it's completely unreliable and useless. Um, we also have the problem that a lot of companies haven't adopted P3P because, well, why? Why should they? What incentives do they have? What benefit would it be for them to do it? There really isn't any. Um, and we haven't seen regulators actually taking any actions about this. So. After that whole experience with P3P, people have been going around saying, well, P3P is dead, time to move on, need something new. And so in 2010, um, a new idea was floated, and this was the notion of something called do not track. 
Um, and basically what people said is, you know, the situation right now is that we have advertisers that are going around collecting information and targeting people. And um, they need this for their business models. But there's some people who don't want to be tracked. And we want to give people an ability to opt out. But we don't want people to have to go and read through all the, the privacy policies and find the opt outs. And we don't want people to set opt out cookies and then accidentally delete them, which is a big problem. Um, and so uh, wouldn't it be nice if we had some way that people could just kind of flip a switch in their browser and say, don't track me, do not track, and they wouldn't be tracked from here on out. And in the December 2010 FTC staff report, they said, hey, that seems like a pretty good idea. Um, they, they advocated do not track, which they said would likely involve placing a setting similar to a persistent cookie on a consumer's browser and conveying that setting to sites that the browser visits to signal whether or not the consumer wants to be tracked or receive targeted advertising. Um, and the FTC chairman um, uh, last March said, yeah, I think this is a good idea too. And he outlined a number of requirements for do not track. Um, the one which I think is most important is the one I put in red here, that it should be easy to find, easy to understand, and easy to use, um, which so far most of uh, the privacy tools that we've had have not been easy. Um, so uh, Firefox uh, very quickly implemented this in their browser. Um, and uh, if you go to the privacy setting, there's a checkbox. All you have to do is check that box and it says, tell websites I do not want to be tracked. Okay, that seems pretty easy. Um, Internet Explorer uh, also implemented it in IE9. Um, theirs is arguably not quite so easy. Um, you have to... Um, uh, click to add an empty tracking protection list. Um, and once you've done that, then you've turned it on. That's a little weird. Okay. So um, after we saw all this going on, um, my students said, well, gee, um, I wonder how easy these things actually are to use. And we decided to do a study looking at um, the usability, not only of the do not track tools, but some of the other uh, tools that have been developed in the meantime to help um, people um, opt out of or block online behavioral advertising tracking. Um, so we did a usability study um, and we had 45 subjects who came to our lab here at CMU. Um, each one was uh, with us for about 90 minutes um, and each one tested one tool. So we had five people testing each of nine different tools. The tools that we tested included three opt-out tools, um, two web browsers with built-in settings, those were um, Firefox and IE9, and four blocking tools. So th these included um, Ghostery and uh, Adblock Plus um, and some others. Um, when, they, when people came to our lab, we started out by interviewing them about what they knew about um, online behavioral advertising and their attitudes about privacy. Then we showed them a short video that the Wall Street Journal had put together about online behavioral advertising so that they would all kind of have a, a basic uh, level of knowledge about it. Um, then we gave them information about one of our nine privacy tools and we asked them to go um, fetch it from the website and install it on the laptop that we provided to them. Um, we asked them to configure it the way they would like to have it when they used it. Um, then after they did that, we gave them a specific set of configurations and had them try to configure it according to our specification. Um, and then we asked them to do a number of web browsing tasks, um, including going to a particular uh, website and putting an item in a shopping cart and things like that. And we picked tasks that we knew uh, would break with some of the tools to see how they would respond to that and whether they could figure out what to do about the fact that, that it had broken something. So our findings were that overall these tools didn't actually do very well from a usability perspective. Um, people had a lot of trouble understanding what the opt-out tools were actually doing, and they had trouble configuring them. They would see this list of 100 different companies you could opt out of, and they would say, hmm, I don't really recognize any of these companies. How am I supposed to decide which ones to opt out of? Um, they, with the uh, do not track tools, uh, users looked at that and they said, well, tell companies not to track me. Well, how do I know they're really going to respect that? 
Um, that's actually very insightful to our users because, in fact, um, there's really no guarantee that companies will respect do not track at the moment, nor is there actually any agreement as of yet as to what do not track actually means or what a company is supposed to do if they were to respect that. Um, the W3C launched a working group um, just last month that's trying to um, actually standardize that, but it's not standardized yet. So as of today, do not track really doesn't tell you much of anything. Um, there was a lot of jargon in the settings that confused users. Um, users had a lot of trouble understanding what they were doing in the configuration. Um, we had many cases where users would go and try to configure a tool, and they would say, OK, I've set this up to block everything. In fact, they'd set it up to block nothing. Um, and so that, that, that was uh, kind of scary, that, that it wasn't the, ca the case that users were just confused and didn't know what to do, but they actually had confidence that they had done things correctly when, in fact, they had not. Um, users also assumed that if they were installing or enabling a privacy tool, that the default settings would be fairly privacy protective. And so often they would accept the default settings thinking it was a high level of privacy, when, in fact, in many of these tools, the default setting is not a high level of privacy. You have to actually change it to get a high level of privacy. Um, and we also ran into problems when, um, when these protections ended up actually breaking things. Um, and users really wanted their settings such that they could have as much privacy as possible without breaking things. Just to show you a few examples, um, this one is Adblock Plus. Um, and when you configure it, you have to choose a filtering subscription. And it doesn't matter that you guys can't read this. Um, even if you could, it wouldn't really be very useful. You can see it's just a bunch of different names of filtering subscriptions, and the user is supposed to select them somehow. Um, if uh, a, a user uh, is using Adblock Plus and wants to try to unblock something because something's not working, they see this. and they really, again, have no idea where to start, what to click. Uh, here we have the web browser's built-in settings. So on the left, we have Firefox. On the right, we have Internet Explorer. Um, you can see on the left, um, if you want to uh, block third-party cookies, uh, you can find that buried in this Firefox menu. Uh, but actually, that only comes up if you have already selected this tab here, Use Custom Settings for History. If you don't have that tab selected, you don't actually see the third-party cookie stuff at all, which is kind of weird. Um, in IE, if you want to block um, third-party cookies, you won't find it anywhere on this privacy page. You have to actually click on the Advanced tab to go find that. Um, here is the, the opt-out page um, from the DAA. Um, and when, when you go to that page, um, you see a uh, opt-out setting for Yahoo and nobody else. We're not quite sure why. Um, if you go to the, if you try to find the opt-out page from the DAA, you get to this page here. Um, and users often looked at that and weren't quite sure how to get to the opt-out part. It turns out what you have to do is you have to click on this big check mark. Um, but that wasn't entirely obvious to users. And some of our users actually ended up on the page for if you are a company, how to join this program. And they got really confused when they got to the part about you have to pay $5,000. <laughs> you really weren't quite sure what that was about. Um, if you go through and try to opt out, um, you'll find that some of the sites you might want to opt out of aren't in English. Um, so in our study, we had one subject who um, was very, very determined, and he wanted to opt out of absolutely everything. He spent 47 minutes doing the opt-out configuration. Um, and he got to this page. It was in Japanese. He couldn't read it, so he actually went to Google Translate and translated it so he could figure out how to opt out. Um, I, I can't imagine that very many people would actually go to that sort of effort to figure out how to opt out of things. Um, Let's see, this was uh, the Evidon website. Um, if you opt out here, after you opt out, you get some feedback over here in this column. And um, it says things, some of the things it says opted out. So that's good. But some of them say opt out request sent. And our users looked at that and said, well, what do you mean the request is sent? Either it's opting me out or it's not. Why, why is it just the request is sent? What does that mean? And I honestly don't really know what that means. Um, this is Ghostery here. Um, and uh, Ghostery, by default, when you turn it on, this box here for enable web, web bug blocking is not checked. 
So in fact, Ghostery is not blocking anything. Um, unfortunately, most of our users thought it was. Um, and then if you do check it, then you get this long list of, um, of things that you could choose from, whether to block or not, and that confused users as well. And we had privacy mark. Privacy mark, when you get that, it says uh, click and drag to your bookmarks bar. And so you're supposed to drag it up here to your bookmarks bar, only it turns out by default Firefox doesn't have the bookmarks bar turned on anymore. So users are scratching their heads, what bookmarks bar? Um, here's Taco. Um, and uh, Taco uh, gives you some, some uh, confusing feedback uh, up here in this little um, menu up here, it tells you about what it's doing, and uh, if you want to, um, if you want to understand what it's tracking, uh, you have to kind of go through several clicks to get to this menu, and um, you can uh, take a look at what it's doing. Um, and there's just kind of an overwhelming amount of information here, um, including uh, you know how many different things are blocked. And then in uh, the IE tracking protection list, so this is what's built into IE9, um, if you want to turn on the, um, the tracking protection list, um, you go to this setting on tracking protection list, and a lot of people looked at that and said, okay, I've turned it on, I'm done. Um, in fact, you're not done. You have to click on this link here, get a tracking protection list online. If you don't click on that and go get one, you may have turned it on, but it doesn't actually have a tracking protection list installed, so it's actually not doing anything. Um, and this was something that most users didn't actually notice. Okay, so those are just a few of the examples of some of the problems that we saw. So I'm going to wrap up now with um, just a few uh, recommendations. Okay, so after 15 years here of notice and choice, what, what have we learned? Um, well, we learned what I guess we actually already knew 15 years ago, that current privacy policies are failing consumers. They're still failing consumers. Um, now we actually have empirical studies that show that they're failing consumers and that more standardized policies would be better for consumers. Um, we've learned that we can do machine-readable privacy policies um, and that that might be a way forward, um, except that it didn't work out so well, largely because of enforcement issues. Um, nonetheless, I think that there's a lot of uh, promise with machine-readable privacy policies, and I would hope going forward that any uh, efforts to standardize privacy policies would have a machine-readable component. Um, P3P had problems for all sorts of reasons, but fundamentally, I think it was actually a step in the right direction, and that future efforts could really build on what was done with P3P. Um, Another notion which uh, I haven't heard much discussion about, but which I think could be useful, is the idea of having standard policy types. So instead of a website having to describe in all their gory detail this, uh, this very complicated privacy policy, what if there were only, say, three or five types of privacy policies? And they just had to say, I'm a type A or I'm a type C. Okay, and then consumers could say, well, you know, when I'm, when I'm uh, uh, going to um, bank sites, you know, they better be a type A. And if I'm going to a search engine, a type C would be acceptable. Um, and you can just set up your browser to just look at this very high level um, at different types of privacy policies. And in the, instead of seeing 100 different companies that might track you online, you could just say, well, allow the type A's in and block all the others. Um, I, I think it would take a lot of um, kind of industry will to make something like that happen, but it might be an easier way forward um, for consumers. Um, finally, the usability of privacy tools right now is uh, pretty dismal. Um, and I think that um, it's not enough for companies to say, we built it, it's done, but they really do need to check to see whether anybody can actually use the tools that they've built. Um, we can't rely on users being able to distinguish all this privacy jargon, to be able to distinguish the different, uh, 100 different um, ad companies. Um, and it's also important that these tools work in a way that doesn't break websites, because that's not going to be acceptable to users either. So let me leave you with another Esther Dyson quote. Uh, we opened uh, with Esther Dyson uh, back towards the beginning. Um, and this is, again, something that, that Esther said uh, almost 15 years ago, but I think it still holds true today. Um, industry disclosure schemes often founder without strong government public pressure. 
Otherwise, companies are simply too busy to adopt them, and customers don't factor the information disclosed into their buying habits. Um, and I think uh, we're seeing the same thing today, that if we really want to have a meaningful notice and choice approach, um, we really need to have some teeth behind it. We need to continue to have um, the pressure from the government that companies actually have to do this. Um, and we need to have the pressure from the public that, we, that something has to happen. Otherwise, I think you know, we'll have do not track and we'll have these new tools. And in a few years, people will have lost interest. And then you know, 15 years from now, we'll be having the same conversation again. So thank you. study that tries to assess what consumer sentiment is towards this? Now, I mean, I know, you know some people will go a long way to save 50 cents on a cheeseburger, and <laughs> some people really just don't want to be bothered. Like, I, I don't have a good sense of what, you know, if, if, if the kind of general public had their way, what would the default setting be? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so there, there are a number of studies, including some that we've done um, and, and some that other people have done, that interview the public about you know, do they want to be tracked. And um, most people don't want to be tracked. Um, uh, I, I think the majority of people don't want to be tracked, and they don't like the advertising. Um, there are some people who are OK with it, especially if they think they can get discounts or things like that. Um, but, but I think uh, it, it's really kind of an overwhelming majority of people who, who really don't want to be tracked. Um, there is um, an issue, though, of you know, what people say and what they actually do. So you know, people tell you they don't want to be tracked um, in the survey, and then you go watch them do something that's uh, contrary to that. And so there's a lot of questions about why that happens. But, uh, but it seems to do largely to the fact that um, it's difficult for people to figure out what they can do about it. And they often feel like, well, I don't like it, but what am I going to do? Any other questions? All right, thank you. <laughs>